accept 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 did you hear what I just heard accept turned into septic oh boy certainly don't want that in a relationship now do you you may be asking yourself, what in the world is he doing? Well, I happen to have a laptop right in front of me, and I am going through and accepting changes to my latest book from my editor. And there are a lot of them, as usual. What does it have to do with what I want to talk about? Well, it has a lot to do with what I want to talk about, actually. So let's just jump into it, right? Oh, by the way, my name is Jack Wallen. Thank you for giving me a little bit of time of your time. So the other day, after I announced that the Me and My Muse project had a home and a director, my best friend reached out to me and he said, are you sure you want to have another person directing this show that's yours and that is so close to you and near and dear to your heart and soul? Now, you have to understand that he's coming from a place of not knowing all that much about how theater and TV and film work. So I had to fill him in. And essentially, I told him that although I will be directing or at least serving as the director of photography for the filmed sections of the show, because I have a very specific vision that I want to realize, under this film. I cannot, as an actor, direct myself on stage. Why? Well, now, you probably have seen in many instances on TV, mostly TV, not very rarely on film, but actors who direct a, an episode of, of a show that they're in. Well, they can do that because they can then see the dailies, watch what they're doing, and then fix it. Now, of course, I could film rehearsals of the show, watch them and fix it, but that's just inconvenient. And, and the way I look at theater is a uh, collaborative art form. So I need a third party to look at the pictures that we're painting on stage to make sure they, it looks good and no one is upstaging themselves and to make sure that the intentions of me and the other actors are coming off and blah, blah, blah. And I just, it's something that I can't do by myself. I can't do, I can't be on stage and in the audience at the same time. Although, again, I will mention that that sort of happened to me once during a production of Amadeus, but that's another story for another time. So after I, I had that discussion with him, I decided that I wanted to talk to you about something that I've mentioned before on a number of occasions. And that something is the relationship between you as an artist and the person, the people that are also involved in your art. I'm going to talk about this as it applies to being an actor and a writer. But trust me when I tell you that this does apply to other art forms and even well, just about anything. It can apply to you at your job or you in your relationships, anything your family, your friends, whatever, it applies. Let's first talk about the world of theater because that is that was my first passion and it is the thing for which I do actually have a degree in. When I graduated from Purdue University studying the Meisner technique, their goal was to graduate students who were what they called director proof. Now that doesn't mean that they don't need a director out in the audience to paint the pictures for them and make sure that they are, that everything they do is advancing their vision and such and so forth. But what it means is that they graduated actors that didn't depend on a director such that, and this has happened to me on a couple of occasions throughout my career, when you run into a situation where you have a director who, and I say this very carefully, doesn't exactly know what they're doing, you can still deliver. You can still create something that an audience would want to watch. Because when you're working with a director that can't 
quite deliver the goods, you still have to get to the finish line. So my professors at Purdue wanted to ensure that they graduated actors that were capable of doing that should the occasion arise. Now, after I graduated, I approached the realm of professional acting a very specific way, one that I believed helped me quite a bit. In that, every new job, every new production that I went into, I had one goal. And that one goal wasn't to be the best actor that has ever performed that role ever, although that is nice when, when you actually can achieve that. My goal was to make that theater want to hire me again. And what that means is, is I have to act professionally, be punctual, be friendly, be kind, be courteous, give everything I have, don't bring drama onto the set, don't bring drama, don't bring drama into the rehearsal, just be professional in every sense of the word. And I fully believe that that approach was one of the reasons why, after I graduated from Purdue, that I went from gig to gig to gig to gig. There was very little downtime for me as a professional actor for about 20 years. And if you approach that in such a way, I promise you, you'll have an easier time. Now, how does, what does that have to do with relationships? Well, let me talk about those directors and the relationship between an actor and a director. It is your job as an actor to deliver what the director wants. The director has, has a vision for the show. And it is their job at the beginning of rehearsal to tell you what that vision is, to lay it out and make sure that all of the things that you do in rehearsal move that vision forward. Now there may be times, and there have been times in my career, where I have discovered something that I wanted to give to the character, to bring to the show, and the director comes to me and say, okay, you made a choice. I'm not sure if it's working. Or the director will come to me with a choice, and I'll say, okay, that's a great idea. I have, a, I have another idea, can I try it? And if you don't like it, well, obviously we'll, you know, we'll do what, I'll do what you want. And most directors are very accommodating. They'll say, yeah, sure, try it, let me see it. And there have been times when I have done that and directors said, oh yes, I love that, let's keep that. And there are times when a director said, okay, I like it, but it's not quite there yet, let's see if we can get it to the finish line. And there are other times when a director has said, okay, I like that, that's a good choice, but it doesn't quite fit my vision for the show. Can we try this? And then there are other times, other unfortunate times when a director has said, no, do this. And there's no compromise, there's no discussion. It's just, no, you have to do it this way. And when that happens, you are beholden to the director to do what the director wants. Now, I have had instances, one in particular, where the director was a little bit off such that the director didn't quite understand what the show was about or what the character was about or the driving force of the character. So what I had to do was I had to understand what the show was about, but present it in such a way that it didn't, that I didn't butt heads with the director. I still had to come off professional and make it seem like my choice was the director's choice. And that's a very fine line to tread, and it's hard to do, but sometimes it's just necessary. But again, theater is a collaborative art. You can't go into rehearsal and say, it's my way and nothing else. You can't do that. You can't be a diva. Those divas, people don't want to work with divas. And I guarantee you that if a director has a choice between a Diva that has talent up here, but a personality that's down here and is hard to work with, or someone with talent that's right here, but a personality that's up here and is very easy to work with, they're gonna take this person every time. 
Now let's talk about writing. As a writer, again, I'm going to use the word beholden because it applies. I am beholden to the publisher. The publisher, I, I have brought the idea to the publisher. I've said, this is what I want. This is what I want to write. The publisher says, yes, write that. But when the publisher says, write that, they mean write that. Now, you write that. You write that book. You write that first draft. And then, of course, you, you read it, change it, read it again, change it, send it to beta readers, take in their feedback, read it, change it again, and then you send it to the editor. And that's where the fun begins. A good editor will do this. A good editor will make changes in such a way that it doesn't affect your voice as a writer. That's what a really good editor does. A really good editor is so subtle that, that they could leave track changes off and make changes to the document without you ever knowing it. They should never do that, ever. But they, sh they, but they could. A really, really good editor could do that. A good editor can make changes that are very close to your voice that you might have to tweak a little bit. A bad editor cannot do that. But regardless of the type of editor you have, it is not your job to fight with the editor. Again, collaborative art. It is your job, your job and the editor's job to work together to improve the book. And that is truly all that an editor is trying to do is make your book more readable. So when you start getting arrogant and angry about the changes that an editor is making to your book, then there's going to be a problem. Because you have to step back and ask yourself, why am I getting angry that this editor is making these changes in this manuscript? Especially if the goal of the editor is to help make this book more readable. They're not going to change the story unless there are problems with the story. And if there are problems with the story, they're not going to change it. They're just going to make suggestions. But their, their, ob their objective is to not change, is to change as little as possible while making it still, making it better, while improving it. I have reached the point, especially with the editor that my publisher's editor, we have, we have reached a point in a relationship where I, as I was doing at the very beginning, I was just going accept, 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 accept. I can go through the track changes in those documents that I get back from my editor and just, just start hitting accept until I get to a comment. And then I go, okay, stop. Let's address this comment. Because when she makes a comment, that means there's something that's either wrong or something could be improved. It's not a simple change in grammar. It's not a change in a comma or a change in an ellipsis or a semicolon or, or a, a corrected spelling. It is literally the, a comment that says, okay, we need to address this. Let's do that. So I stop, I address it, then I go on, accept, 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 accept. Oh, there's another comment. Let's deal with that. I know writers. I know two different, I, I know many types of writers, but there are two different writers I want to talk about. I know writers who will just open up their manuscript from an editor and go to track changes, accept all, and they're done. Then they have to go back, go through the comments and go, okay, I gotta address this, I gotta address this. And then there are, then there are writers out there that will go through the comments and just reject all because they think their crap doesn't stink and the first draft that they send the editor is the penultimate version of the book and nothing should change, period. They wrong. That's why we need editors. Because we as writers cannot see everything in our book. We do not see all of the mistakes. I have, I'm not kidding, I have written a book, read it, Correct it as much as I could, send it to beta readers, get it back, reread it, and still found problems. After the second reading from me and the beta readers. And let me tell you this, the way I write that second rewrite 
or second read is actually a third read because every time I write something, I go back to what I wrote the previous night and reread it and edit it as I go. So I am living proof that writers need editors, that we cannot see the mistakes that we generate because my, my brain is going to self-edit those things and see what it meant to write. Sometimes that means I'm going to fill in the blanks and fix the problems without actually seeing them. So the relationship between writer and editor should definitely be a collaborative effort and it, the writer should be in a position to say, okay, the, the editor is there to make this read better. They are not my enemy, they are my friend. And if they say something is correct, most often it's correct. If they say something is wrong, most often it is wrong. There are, that is not a definitive statement though. There are times I have caught errors, very, very small and slight errors in the final proof. And sometimes that just happens because there's so many track changes that things get lost in the, in the mix. My point here is, is that the goal, anybody who is collaborating on a piece of art, the goal is to make it as good as possible. And you need to approach your art in such a way. And I just felt my mic fall. It's way down there. And you're going to hear this ruffle, 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 ruffle. Oh my gosh. I have my hand down my shirt or up my shirt and I'm retaping my mic. How unprofessional, how gauche. But I'm a little hungry and I don't want you to hear my stomach rumble. And we're having Indian food tonight, so my stomach is really grumbling because it's going, feed me now. Okay, enough of that. You get it. Relationships within the realm of art need to be held so dearly and so carefully. And they need to be they need to they need to be allowed to flourish not you don't want to strangle them because if you do if you prevent them from flourishing they are going to go in the opposite direction and chances are you might not work with that person or that company ever again and you can apply this to anything Go into any job, any relationship that you ever experience with the thought, I want to make them want to hire or be with me again. If you do that, your professional life, your artistic life, and your life as a human being will be exponentially easier and better, I promise. And with that, I'm going to take this little pointy finger and go back down here and start going accept, 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 and not allow that accept to turn into septic. You know what I mean? <laughs> Thank you so much for giving me a little bit of your time today. I know your time is precious, and, and it, but it means so much to me that you're willing to give it over to me for just a moment. I hope that you have learned something from this, or maybe I've entertained you. And if you know somebody that might be able to get something from this, please share it with them. And if you haven't yet so far, subscribe to this channel. I'm not trying to make any money from you. I'm just trying to pass on a little kindness and a little information. And most of all, I always want to make sure that you and those you love and respect and work with have a wonderful, wonderful day.